I'm going to talk about spine tumors today. Just a quick overview. Uh, we'll talk about the different compartments, extradural, intradural, extramedullary, and intramedullary. And for each of these compartments, I'm going to talk about the imaging technique, primary tumors, secondary or metastatic tumors, and tumor mimics. The first thing we need to do is determine which compartment the lesion is in. Is it extradural, intradural, extramedullary, or intramedullary? That's critical because the differential is going to depend on the compartment. An extradural lesion will push the dura against the spinal cord. Extradural lesions typically will disturb the epidural fat. Intradural extramedullary lesions are going to push the spinal cord away from the dura. You see that best at the edges of the lesions. Note here the epidural fat is not involved, so there's no perturbation of the epidural fat with these uh, lesions. And finally, intramedullary lesions will expand the cord and narrow the CSS space both in front and behind the spinal cord. Okay, so first let's talk about extradural lesions. First in terms of technique, T1-weighted images, the low signal tumor is going to stand out against the high signal of the normal marrow fat. The problem is in children and patients with chronic anemia, the normal marrow may not have much fat, so in those patients you may not see very much contrast between the tumor and the normal marrow. Stir images, the tumor is going to be bright. The normal marrow fat signal is going to be suppressed. Overall, this is the most sensitive sequence for looking at extradural lesions. The downside of this is lesions that are very sclerotic are going to be dark on the stir so that you may not see them. Contrast enhanced T1-weighted images, most of the the lesions will enhance with contrast. You have to be a little careful here because if you use T1 post contrast without fat suppression, sometimes the tumor can be iso intense to the normal marrow on the post contrast images, uh, as you can see uh, in uh, one of the lesions uh, on this slide. So typically, when we do post contrast images, we'll use fat suppression. The post-contrast T1-weighted images are very good for looking at epidural tumor. And they're very helpful to distinguish tumor from disc herniation. Herniated disc will enhance only at the periphery, whereas generally the tumors will enhance, the whole lesion will enhance. Primary extradural tumors we will uh, look at some of these in more detail. First, uh, here's a lesion that's bright on the T1-weighted images, also bright on the T2-weighted images. This is a typical appearance for a hemangioma. The hemangiomas have both fat and vascular components. The fat components will be bright on T1. Notice uh, that the areas that are bright on T1 are dark on STIR because the, the T1 bright components are the fat components. The other component of the hemangioma is the vascular component. That component is going to be dark on T1 and bright on the STIR. So if we want to look for hemangioma, determine if something's hemangioma, we want to see if there's any fat in it. Unfortunately, some of the hemangiomas will have little or no fat, and that can make it very difficult to distinguish these from metastatic lesions. The vascular component of the hemangiomas will enhance with contrast. The vascular channels and the fat interspersed with the thickened trabecula often cause a striated appearance. This is very typical striated or corduroy appearance. Uh, 
uh, on uh, transverse images, sometimes it causes somewhat of a sunburst uh, appearance. On CT, the stippled or polka dot appearance is very typical. Sometimes uh, this can be helpful if the lesion does not have much fat. Sometimes the CT appearance will be very characteristic with the thickened uh, trabeculae causing that polka dot appearance. Occasionally, hemangiomas can have a soft tissue component. Uh, note this patient uh, has two hemangiomas, uh, both having T1 bright components. The uh, uh, upper lesion here uh, previously had a vertebroplasty that accounts for the, the dark the signal that we see. Uh, these are the transverse uh, images. Uh, note uh, there's both a paraspinal and an epidural soft tissue mass associated with this. So, so this is not common, uh, but occasionally we'll see it. Uh, this paraspinal and epidural component typically will not be T1 bright. It's generally a soft tissue signal and it will enhance with contrast. So uh, these can occasionally cause cord compression as in this case. Uh, some people term these aggressive hemangiomas. This patient has a, a lesion involving the posterior uh, elements. Uh, it uh, uh, has a rim here that's bright on these stir images, also bright on these T2 gradient echo images. Uh, the central portion of the lesion has signals similar to the marrow fat. This is the typical appearance of an osteochondroma. The osteochondromas usually involve the posterior elements of the spine. The central portion is cancellous or marrow, usually contiguous with the marrow of the adjacent vertebra, and it's surrounded by a rim of cortical bone with this overlying cartilaginous cap. The cartilaginous cap is a very T2 bright. Cartilage has very T2 bright, so this cartilaginous cap is very T2 bright. Uh, these rarely degenerate into malignancy, uh, occasionally in the patients who have multiple hereditary exostoses. Osteoblastoma, another uh, uncommon Vertebral, primary vertebral tumor, usually young patients. The primary tumors usually are younger patients. Again, also usually occurs in the posterior elements. On CT, these lesions sometimes have an ossified central component. This patient has an expansile lesion in the sacrum, see just a very thin rim of bone, a large adjacent soft tissue mass. This is a giant cell tumor. Usually these occur in the sacrum, occasionally in other vertebral bodies. Expansile purely lytic lesion, often with an associated soft tissue mass. Here's an MRI on this uh, patient with giant cell tumor, uh, we see the large soft tissue mass associated with the uh, lesion. Uh, in this case, it uh, has a heterogeneous contrast enhancement. This lesion is very T2 bright, enhances uh, heterogeneously with contrast, Large uh, epidural component compresses the brain stem. This is the typical appearance for chordoma. Chordomas arise from the notochordal remnants. So they involve the vertebral body. Most of the primary tumors involve the posterior arch. The giant cell tumors and chordomas uh, involve the vertebral body. These are interesting and they can involve two or more adjacent vertebrae and the intervening disc. Most tumors do not go beyond the intervertebral disc. Uh, 
about half of them in the sacrum, 35% in the clivus, and 15% in the vertebrae, and calcification is very frequent. These are very high, to, high signal on T2. Uh, there's often a low signal intensity capsule and septations in these lesions. So another patient with a chordoma, this one arising from the vertebrae in the cervical spine. Notice when they arise, when they originate from the vertebrae, they do not typically start in the midline. They often start uh, off to one side near, uh, near the uh, region of the vertebral joint. Has a big epidural and prevertebral soft tissue mass. Notice uh, here that it involves two adjacent to vertebrae. This uh, lesion go just goes from one to the next. Uh, T2 weighted images, remember it has a very high signal on T2 weighted images. Secondary or metastatic extradural tumors, the typical players uh, here. When we're dealing with metastatic lesions, most of the lesions will be dark on T1, bright on STIR, any part of the vertebra can be involved. Don't always assume every lesion is a, is a metastasis. Remember, look for T1 bright lesions, which represent hemangiomas. Very sclerotic lesions show up very well on T1, but not so well on the STIR images. Occasionally, melanoma and hemorrhagic metastases can be bright on T1. So usually if you see the lesion bright on T1, it's almost always a metastasis, except occasionally you can have melanoma metastases or hemorrhagic metastases that are bright on T1. This, uh, in this particular case, we're dealing with a melanoma metastasis. So that is the one thing that, that can mess you up in terms of T1 bright, meaning hemangioma. Lymphoma is a little bit unusual, but sometimes that can present as an epidural mass without any bony involvement. Most of the other tumors uh, metastasize to the bone and then spread to the epidural space. We frequently see compression fractures in the spine and we need to determine whether compression fracture is benign or related to a metastasis. So look at the bone marrow signal. If it's an old lesion, like in this, normal bone marrow signal. So if you see normal bone marrow signal, we know that's uh, an old benign compression fracture. In an acute benign compression fracture, usually the T1 hypo intense signal only involves part of the vertebra, usually is a linear or band-like configuration. We generally see little or no epidural or paraspinal mass, and the total volume of the vertebral body is decreased. So it's not filled with, it's an osteoporotic vertebra, it's not filled with tumor, so the total volume of the vertebra is diminished so that when it compresses, it does not squeeze out into the epidural space. If you're not sure, get a follow-up in six weeks and the signal abnormality will be less pronounced. Malignant compression fracture. Generally, the entire vertebral body is gonna be low signal on T1 by the time it fractures. Frequently, we see epidural and paraspinal soft tissue masses, often has this posterior bulging appearance to it. Since the tumor increases the total volume of the vertebra, it's filled with tumor cells. When it compresses, it's going to squeeze out into the epidural and prevertebral soft tissues. Look for additional metastatic lesions. In cases that you're not sure, get a six week follow-up. It'll either be unchanged or progressed. Extradural tumor mimics, two things we see frequently, spondylodiscitis and sequestrated disc fragment. Uh, 
In patients with pyogenic spondylodiscitis, typically we have two adjacent vertebrae involved with the abnormalities centered on the disc, often have T2 bright signal within the disc. Tuberculous spondylitis can look even more like a tumor since it's not centered on the disc. Tuberculous infection spreads along the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. Patients with sequestrated disc fragment, if we give contrast, we'll see enhancement only around the, the periphery of the disc as opposed to enhancement of the whole lesion that we see with the tumor. Sequestrated disc fragment, see the enhancement just along the periphery. Let's now look at intradural extramedullary compartment. In terms of technique, on T1 weighted images, the tumors will be slightly hyperintense compared to the CSF. On T2, hypo intense compared to the CSF. And notice that it's an intradural extramedullary lesion. It pushes the spinal cord away from the dura and it widens the CSF space at the edges of the lesion. See how the CSF space is widened because it pushes the uh, spinal cord away from the dura. Uh, and that's an excellent sign that we're dealing with an intradural extramedullary lesion. Post-contrast T1, all of the lesions will enhance with contrast. Post-contrast images are essential to detect leptomeningeal metastases. Primary intradural extramedular lesions, two categories, either usually either nerve sheath tumors or meningiomas. Nerve sheath tumor most often is an intradural extramedullary lesion. We can see it here. Here's one. This patient has another one over here. Nerve sheath tumors can sometimes be extradural as this lesion involving the neural foramen, but does not have an intradural component. And sometimes they can have a, a dumbbell shape with both an intradural and an extradural component. On CT, these are usually low density. On non-contrast T1, generally they're iso-intense to the spinal cord. On T2, usually they're quite T2 hyper-intense, uh, often have a central hypo-intense component to them. Post-contrast, generally they're going to enhance homogeneously, although often they can have a more heterogeneous appearance because they can uh, have cystic non-enhancing components, as in this case. These are very slow growing lesions. They may cause posterior scalloping of the vertebral bodies, widening of the neural foramina. You can see here, the neural foramen is, is widened. Uh, they always have a very sharp scalloped margin because they're slow growing tumors. So uh, the margins are very sharp and often sclerotic. Neurofibromas are usually associated with NF1, especially if you see multiple neurofibromas. NF1 patients also have increased incidence of astrocytomas. Schwannomas often have a lobulated appearance. Usually they're solitary. They are increased in incidence in patients with NF2. NF2 patients typically have bilateral acoustic schwannomas and multiple meningiomas and ependymomas. 
Meningiomas, most often in the thoracic spine, uh, less common in the cervical, and for some reason fairly uncommon in the lumbar spine. In the thoracic spine, they're usually posterior, whereas in the cervical spine, they're more often anterior. Like meningiomas intracranially, they're more common in women. Frequently, these are calcified just like the intracranial meningiomas. The heavily calcified ones will be very uh, dark on T2. This patient has a meningioma anteriorly. Of course, just goes against what I said that most of the thoracic ones are posterior. This one is anterior. Actually, if we look carefully, this patient has another one posteriorly here. So a couple of meningiomas in the spine. Intracranially, there are also a bunch more meningiomas. The patient also has a left-sided acoustic schwannoma. Uh, had had one on the right side too, but it had been resected. And this is a patient with NF2. Secondary intradural extramedullary lesions uh, or leptomeningeal metastases, these can occur by two mechanisms. Uh, they can spread to the spine, they can spread to the CSF from a, a primary uh, brain or spinal cord uh, tumor, uh, so called drop metastases, where tumor on the surface of the brain breaks off into the subarachnoid space. The other mechanism is direct hematogenous spread to the subarachnoid space. Leptomeningeal metastases, metastases can have three different appearances. Uh, first, you may see a fine layer of enhancement coating the spinal cord and nerve roots. Second, you can have focal enhancing nodules. This patient has both a, a focal enhancing nodule here, as well as some linear enhancement along the nerve roots. And finally, you can have diffuse enhancement of the subarachnoid space. Notice here, the entire subarachnoid space is enhanced. This is a post-contrast T1 weighted image. Almost looks like a T2 weighted image because the whole CSF is enhanced. Differential for leptomeningeal metastases, infection, meningitis, sarcoid, and Guillain-Barre. Here we can see enhancement along nerve roots, enhancing nerve roots on the axial. This turned out to be a patient with Lyme disease. In this patient, only the anterior nerve roots enhance with contrast. This is a patient with Guillain-Barre. And finally, we'll discuss the intraoral compartment. For technique, T1-weighted images are good for looking at the gross morphology of the spinal cord. Uh, the T2-weighted images, the Tumors will be bright as well as the surrounding edema. Hemorrhagic components are going to be dark on T2. And the contrast enhanced T1 weighted images are very helpful. Essentially, all of the spinal cord tumors will enhance uh, at least to some degree. Uh, unlike the brain tumors, where the low grade tumors uh, uh, generally do not enhance with contrast uh, in the spinal cord. Virtually all of the tumors will enhance. Contrast is very helpful to distinguish the tumor from the surrounding edema or cyst. The primary intramedullary tumors, uh, the three big ones here, astrocytoma, ependymoma, and hemangioblastoma.
Astrocytomas, this is an infiltrating tumor, usually low grade. They have indistinct margins, usually fairly homogeneous, most frequently in children and young adults. Ependymomas tend to be more heterogeneous than astrocytomas, but better circumscribed. If it's a small tumor, they tend to be located centrally because they arise from the ependymal cells. However, once the tumor is large, this uh, you can't really tell what part of the spinal cord it arose from, and we usually see these in adult patients. Two types of ependymomas. This is a cellular ependymoma, and the other type is a mixopapillary ependymoma. The mixopapillary ependymomas usually occur in the conus or phylum terminale, frequently have hemorrhage. The uh, ependymoma we consider an intramedullary tumor, but this, they, uh, these mixopapillary ependymomas occasionally occur in the phylum terminale, in which case it would be actually extramedullary outside of the spinal cord. This patient has a lesion in the spinal cord, very T2 bright uh, here. On T1, there's a very elongated area of T1 low signal, probably a, a syrinx here. And then post contrast, we see a small enhancing nodule in the surface of the cord. This is a typical appearance of a hemangioblastoma. Hemangioblastoma often has a small enhancing nodule on the surface of the cord and a large cyst or syrinx. Uh, these tumors are very vascular. You may see dilated vessels. Generally, they are intramedullary lesions, but occasionally they can be intradural extramedullary and rarely extradural. About 30% will have on Hippolindau, so the majority will if there's a single hemangioblastoma, the majority of those will just be sporadic. Uh, if you see multiple hemangioblastomas, uh, they virtually all will have von Hippel-Lindau. Uh, those patients have hemangioblastomas of the cerebellum, spinal cord, and retina. They also get renal cysts and renal cell carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, pancreatic cysts and islet cell tumors, and endolymphatic sac tumors. Just a little bit about a syrinx. The syrinx is a fluid-filled cavity in the spinal cord, a lot of possible causes, carry malformation, spinal cord tumors, cord compression, trauma, arachnoiditis. Generally, if you see a syrinx, you want to give IV contrast to evaluate it unless there's an obvious carry malformation. Uh, in this patient with a large syrinx, if you look at the top of the image, you can't see this enhancing tumor higher up as the cause of the syrinx. Secondary intramedullary lesions, spinal cord metastases. Most commonly, we see these from lung, breast, or melanoma. They usually have a fairly rapid clinical progression. Differential diagnosis of intramedullary lesions. Demyelinating lesions. This is a case of multiple sclerosis. Neuromyelitis optica. Typically is a larger lesion, often with expansion of the cord and heterogeneous enhancement. Inflammatory processes, myelitis, can be either from infection, immunologic, or sarcoid, as in this case. Another patient with sarcoid causing an intramedullary lesion, and this one intramedullary as well as enhancement along the the surface of the cord or meningeal enhancement in this patient with sarcoid. There's also a, a large category of idiopathic transverse myelitis. We usually only use this term if we find an inflammatory lesion in the spinal cord that we cannot uh, make a, a specific diagnosis, then we use the term idiopathic transverse myelitis. And vascular lesions, uh, this is a patient with a dural arteriovenous fistula causing 
expansion of the conus with high signal. Note all the flow voids on these post contrast images. So just to, to review a few things that we covered. When we see a lesion, we first need to determine whether it's extradural, intradural, extramedullary, or intramedullary. Remember, the extradural lesions will typically involve the epidural fat. They will press the dura against the spinal cord. Intradural extramedullary lesions will not affect the epidural fat and will push the spinal cord away from the dura, widening the CSF spaces at the edges of the lesions, and the intramedullary lesions will expand the spinal cord. Remember the appearance of hemangiomas. Look for the T1 bright component. The T1 bright component is because many of these lesions have some fatty component as well as a vascular component. Uh, the whole lesion is typically bright on T2. Uh, on the stir images, the fat components are dark and the vascular components are bright. And on CT, remember this polka dotted appearance by the thickened trabeculae. Giant cell tumors, most often in the sacrum, expand the bone, often have a large soft tissue mass. Chordomas, very bright on T2, often with dark septations. Benign versus malignant compression fractures. Benign compression fractures typically have band-like T1 hypo intense signal, whereas the malignant fractures, usually the whole vertebral body is involved. Often they have that posterior epidural component with a convex margin to it. Schwannoma versus meningioma. The schwannomas often have a lobulated appearance typically T2 bright with some dark components more centrally. Meningiomas tend to be more homogeneous lesions in the thoracic spine, usually posterior. Three different appearances of leptomeningeal metastases fine enhancement along the nerve roots and spinal cord, nodular enhancing lesions, and diffuse enhancement of the subarachnoid space. Differential for leptomeningeal metastases, meningitis. Top patient has Lyme disease, sarcoid, and Guillain-Barre. Two types of ependymoma, cellular ependymomas and mixopapillary ependymomas. The mixopapillary lesions are the ones that occur in the conus and phylum terminale, often have cystic components and hemorrhage. The mixopapillary lesions are grade one and usually have an excellent prognosis, better than the cellular ependymomas. Differential diagnosis for intramedullary lesions, demyelinating lesions such as multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica often has a bigger lesion with cord expansion. Inflammatory lesions, remember sarcoid. Use the term idiopathic transverse myelitis only when we can't find a 
a specific cause for the lesion. Uh, one thing uh, that can be helpful in terms of distinguishing myelitis from tumor is uh, that tumors will almost always enhance somewhat. Notice this case, the spinal cord is enlarged but does not enhance at all. That would favor this being some type of inflammatory lesion rather than a tumor. And remember vascular lesions such as dura venous fistula, these are often uh, misdiagnosed. Thanks very much for your attention.